So thank you all for joining me here today. I'm so honored and proud to be here and appreciate the opportunity to participate in a deeper dive into how um, to enable using AI responsibly and for the greater good. So you're all likely very familiar with the practices such as security by design and privacy by design. These being a set of tools and design practices and processes that build privacy and security into the very foundation of a product. This way, the safeguards are not left as afterthoughts to be patched on just before a product is released, or worse, only thought of after there is actually an incident. But the trend we are seeing now in the industry is embracing the concept of ethics by design. This means taking ethical principles, which certainly include privacy and security, but they also include concepts such as fairness, explainability, accountability, and transparency, and embedding all of these principles into the design of an AI system, not just in the algorithms, but in every aspect of design and deployment that extends throughout the life cycle of the AI. In other words, when you're at the concept phase of an AI solution, ethics by design should already be one of your primary concerns and design elements. And just as you continuously monitor for privacy leaks or other security vulnerabilities, you continuously monitor for ethical issues. This type of dedication to get in front of ethical issues that can arise when deploying AI tends to require a cultural shift within the companies that are designing AI or putting them into use. I've spent the past couple of years working with IBM and other businesses to take these principles that make up ethics by design and putting them into practice. So my thoughts here today are observations and things that I have learned along this journey. And though I will share my education that I have gained by working with IBM, these are my thoughts and opinions and do not necessarily reflect those of IBM. One of my biggest takeaways from this project has been that when talking about ethics or AI for good or responsible AI, you cannot accomplish that by simply putting a process in place which designers, data scientists, and engineers simply check off that they have run certain tests or enabled certain protective code. While such tests and coding are helpful, and even if they engineer a human in the loop in the system to monitor results, you still have to move beyond all of that so that the entire team understands and are relentlessly looking for unintended consequences and outcomes. And as I said, this starts at the concept phase but you can never let your foot up off the gas. It's imperative that it continues throughout the entire life cycle of the AI system. This persistent watch for unintended consequences requires all stakeholders, not just the designers and developers, to stay curious as to what might happen next and to ask those what if questions. This type of constant curiosity requires a culture that encourages and allows for questions. It ignites a passion for identifying what could go wrong and celebrates the ability to fix it before there's a problem, even if it means starting over from scratch. Now this may sound easy, but what I find is that when you're dealing with AI and other emerging technologies, people have already identified a problem, such as a specific aspect of climate change, finding new ways to cure disease or deliver health care, or creating a smarter city. And this problem solving becomes their mission and their passion. And while that mission is desirable and admirable, they frequently become so fixated on solving that original problem and so excited for their new discovery that sometimes their ability to see other unintended consequences becomes a bit cloudy. And they are also frequently trying to meet deadlines and maintain budgets. And so whether consciously or not, they are incented to not find additional problems. For this project, I'll fo focus on three areas. These three areas uh, drive a cultural shift that expands the scope of problem solving and celebrates those who, who never forget to ask the what if. 
First, the cultural shift requires a value-based leadership. And while the idea of AI ethics may start with enthusiasts speaking up, such as a groundswell within a corporate environment, it needs leadership to help define the mission and truly support and encourage the changes necessary to lead that cultural shift. Leadership cannot provide empty statements, but must demonstrate support with everyday actions. And although news and social media and even the movie industry can highlight issues seen with AI, there is a deep need for meaningful education that drives awareness to the point that the issues are truly understood and the quest to address them is steadfast and not just a checkpoint. And then third, you have to enable the necessary practices by actively listening and creating a continuous loop of dialogue among stakeholders. With value-based leadership, I'll point to Arvind Krishna, IBM CEO, who has stated that trust is a business's license to operate. And at this very high level, that helps define the mission, which is to gain trust. But when talking about ethics, you tend to get a lot of debate, and the concept of ethics is impacted by such things as region, politics, religion, education, and values. So the leadership needs to provide clarity as to what these corporate values look like within their own organization. IBM has defined these values by five key pillars. They are robustness or security, privacy, transparency, explainability, and fairness. Now other groups and corporations may use different definitions, but having that clarity allows the business to define its targets and communicate with customers and society what our concerns are and the actions we plan to take to address it. It gives stakeholders common reference points to set the framework for discussions. And it would be easy to think that trust simply means a customer can trust that the product will behave as it's supposed to. But really it's about developing personal relationships and responsibility and adding depth to the definition of the mission lays the groundwork for building those trustworthy relationships. Now compliance, that can be mandated. If you tell people what the rules and regulations are, then they will follow them. But when working with a top-down mandate for compliance, people tend to focus on avoiding penalties and they lose sight of the ultimate goal, which is to innovate responsibly. With a mandate, you're getting compliance, but you aren't encouraging the type of passion, curiosity, and thought-provoking discussion that creates an entire culture of AI ethics. And it's that culture that actually leads to creative solutions designed to avoid unintended consequences before they ever happen. Leadership by example comes in many forms, both big and small. And certainly making statements both internally and externally in support of a cultural shift helps, but people need to see leaders not just take, talking the talk, but actually walking the walk. As an example, within IBM, we have established an AI ethics board to review proposed use cases for AI and other emerging technologies. This is a necessary step in walking the walk, but do you have to ask, does it really embrace and encourage a cultural shift? Through that review process, we've examined over 150 use cases. And even in the cases in which the decision was to not move forward with a proposal, the consensus from leadership has been that this is an investment well spent, that it encourages innovation that leads to an improvement in a system before it is put into use, and that helps build that trust necessary to win the customer in the first place. To put this a different way, if your AI ethics program is solely about compliance, then all you really do is avoid potential penalties and mitigate costs. But if your AI ethics program is truly a cultural shift towards doing what it takes to create responsible and trustworthy AI systems, it's an investment in innovation that leads to a higher quality product, and it's your values that will differentiate you from your competitors. Seeing the leadership takes this position, that investment in innovation paves the ways for others to follow the path. While values-based leadership is necessary to allow a cultural shift to occur, you also have to enable the others to come along with you. 
Again, in a compliance mode, the engineer says, tell me what test to run and I will run it. In leading a cultural shift, each stakeholder is encouraged to act and to express their thoughts and ideas, which again comes back to the ideas generate innovation. In many discussions such as this, you'll hear that people talk about the importance of diversity and inclusion when designing an AI system. But then frequently the conversation focuses on just diversity and what that means. For a true cultural shift, you can never forget the value of inclusion, meaning that cultural values each stakeholder's ideas and concerns. It encourages conversations. Each must believe that they are in a safe space to speak up, think out of the box, and ask questions such as what if. So it's important to have um, the leaders talking the talk and walking the walk. And once you've created the environment that allows others to ask good questions and speak up, then you have enabled a continuous flow of communications and exchange of ideas. With compliance, you would just have one arrow driving one direction. But with the culture, you develop a model that invites dialogue with the quest for learning, improving, celebrating, and innovating. So if I've worked extensively now on taking these projects, these principles and moving them into practice, I've got two key takeaways for you based on my experience. First, when I work with designers and developers or lead them through an education session, I frequently get a comment back, I don't know anything about ethics. And obviously they must know something because they know right from wrong. But I get their point. They haven't ever done a formal study of the philosophy of ethics, and that's not uncommon. So to get people over that uneasy, uneasiness with talking about ethics, something as broad and debatable as ethics, I ask them to focus on unintended consequences or the accuracy rate of an AI system. It gives them a reference point that they can relate to, and it's sufficient to capture the improvements and innovation we're seeking while not scaring people away from the discussion. In other words, it sparks that feeling of inclusion and enables a conversation that fans the flames of a cultural shift. Second, in all of the use cases I've worked on, I've never once met a development team that intended to cause harm. They all have the best intentions to create AI solutions that's delivering, a, solving a real world problem. No development team has ever said they didn't care if one group suffered a harm as a result of the AI while another group benefited. They all set out with the best intentions and they may have an incredibly diverse team with inclusive policies and they've been using every tool that they can get their hands on to test for fairness and explainability and every other ethical concern that you can think of but every project can benefit from a peer review of sorts, of having a fresh set of eyes take a look at a project. And it's rare that a book gets published without having an editor help with revisions. And if you wrote a paper in high school, you may have asked a friend or a parent for comment, and that was the difference between getting an A or a B on the paper. And if you're publishing a research paper, you may go through a peer review process, which looks for gaps and helps identify weaknesses that can be addressed, resulting in a higher quality paper. So I'm gonna leave you with one last example that has gotten some people to see the value of building a culture that embraces these practices that enable AI ethics. And it's a bit of a silly story, but sometimes it's a good story is all that you need to get people engaged especially if you've only got 20 minutes to do it. So I want you to think of the original Jurassic Park movie from 1993. If you haven't seen it, an eccentric billionaire invests in research that will bring dinosaurs back to life, and he wants to create a resort in which people from around the world can come study and be amazed by living dinosaurs. What could possibly go wrong? He has built a team of top scientists, technologists, animal handlers, and security specialists, and they are all, one, convinced that they have made an amazing discovery that will benefit the world, and two, they can create a safe environment for guests. 
Now, the billionaire, of course, wants to protect his investment, so he seeks an insurance policy to cover the park. The insurance company says, well, we're going to need to send him some specialists to evaluate what you've done here. And the billionaire's team, convinced that they have thought of everything and that nothing can go wrong. But this team from the insurance company, that's your fresh set of eyes, your peer review. So they bring in a botanist, a paleontologist, a mathematician who specializes in chaos theory, and of course, an attorney. They immediately start asking those good questions. What is this? What if that? What if this happens? And they start testing out the billionaire's theories and safeguards. And of course, things go wrong. The security system fails. It turns out that dinosaurs can reproduce despite their genetic engineering. And lo and behold, the predator meat-eating dinosaurs love the chase and want to hunt. If you saw the movie, and in particular, if you saw the movie in a theater like I did, one of the first people to be killed by a dinosaur is the attorney. And in the theater I was in, the audience cheered. Why? Because the attorney was compliance focused. He was a top down mandates only. And if that's the only approach you have, no one would want to listen to you. They'll do what you say because they have to. But if a dinosaur eats you, they're gonna cheer. Now the botanist, the paleontologist, and the mathematician, on the other hand, they all embrace the idea of innovation, but with careful thought and thoughtful safeguards, seeking the advice of many and never forgetting that there may be unintended consequences that, in this case, you really want to avoid. They recognize that no one checklist could suffice when dealing with such emerging breakthroughs. And these people, these were your heroes who, if the billionaire had called on them earlier, you could have improved the work of the first team of scientists, but then you wouldn't have a movie. So with that, I encourage you to find your innovative heroes who can work to together to build a culture that embraces curiosity, and I thank you for your time. <laughs>